So thank you very much for uh, inviting me to attend uh, your meeting this evening. And uh, my name is Don Dafkis, and I am the Applications Engineering Manager for our audio products at Texas Instruments. What I want to tell you about is a new product that we have um, that we just released to the market, which actually Alex was telling me maybe might be of interest to you guys for a project. And that is a 175 watt by, by two Class D amplifier. And when I talked to Dr. Ruzba about doing the presentation, he suggested I might want to mention a little bit about what Class D amplifiers are, because maybe you guys aren't all familiar with those. So I'm sure those of you who have taken the kind of higher level analog classes know about like Class A amplifiers, Class B amplifiers, Class A B amplifiers. So who knows about those? They should all be raising their hands, actually. <laughs> <laughs> all right, very good. So, um, so those are kind of the traditional ones that we've been using for years and years and years in the audio audio industry, and they all have uh, different trade-offs that you take into consideration. What we did is we were looking at different ways to do amplifiers, and we didn't invent Class D amplifiers at TI but we were the ones that kind of first made commercial integrated circuit versions of them. So prior to that, it had all been discrete circuits, like uh, down in Elkhart, Indiana, there's a guy that's been doing it for like 50 years, I don't know how old he is. He actually, like, when I went to visit him once, he gave me a paper from like the 80s and the IEEE about how to drive H bridges for audio stuff. So it's been around for a while. The thing that we brought was we really uh, came up with the, with the ability to put it all into an integrated circuit. So before that, it was the discrete components. The idea behind the Class D amplifier, which is shown on, on this page here, is the reason that we are interested in Class D amplifiers a lot more efficient than a Class A B amplifier. The problem is in a battery-operated <coughs> application or a application where you don't have the ability to have a large heat sink, the Class A B amplifier starts to have problems. So you can see here, we, we're, we're comparing two points on the curves here. So this is the class AB um, delivering a, about 0.4 watts into the speakers. And you can see that it's dissipating almost 0.4 watts as heat in the amplifier itself. So it's, uh, it's just a little bit more than 50% efficient there. And when you compare that to the class B amplifier for the same 0.4 watts of output power, it's about 120 milliwatts. You can see the, the Class D one is uh, much more efficient, and this is kind of our, this device that we were comparing here was originally for notebook computers. Most of your notebook computers now have Class D amplifiers as the uh, speaker drivers. So the, the second thing that, that we wanted to talk about here is the idea of a crest factor, and this is, this is something which we struggle, it seems like we struggle a lot with this in the audio engineering is how do you determine, how do you design your system, how do you, how do you spec your power supply, how do you spec your thermal system, and what most people do is they use sine waves to measure the performance of their device. And that's great, but the problem with it is the sine wave has a crest factor, which is the peak power divided by the average power. It has a crest factor of, I think it's 3 dB. And for real music, it's a much higher crest factor. So a lot of time your amplifier is not actually delivering a lot of power, because if you think about it, it's very dynamic. So the thing that we like to look at here is this, this idea of crest factor. And even though your amplifier is maybe designed to drive a one watt speaker, because of the crest factor, most of the time it's going to be running around, say, 0.125 watts of output power. And what you see here is the uh, if you compare the efficiency different at, difference at one watt, you know there's still a significant difference. But if you go back to the 0.125 watts, you can see there's a huge difference because the class AB is running at like say 10% efficiency, and the class D is running at about 75% efficiency. So for battery powered applications, this is really a key uh, element is the benefit of class D and. We actually had some customers visiting us a couple weeks ago that was one of the very first customers that we worked with 
for Class B amplifiers, and it's a cell phone company that's headquartered in uh, Finland, and we worked with them very early on with this, and the CTO actually came to visit us about a month ago, and he was, you know, we were, like, I was like, oh, you were the guy? I was the guy, and we were, like, trading war stories from back in the day, and, you know, he's like, yeah, you know, we determined that this was really good for our battery life, so we really wanted to drive Class D into everything, so. Our first major like application win for the Class D amplifier was in uh, cell phone applications. A lot of what I do as an application engineer is we introduce new technology to the market and there's always questions like, oh, is this new technology as good as the old te technology? How does it differ? So we, we struggle a lot with how to do demos and measurements and stuff to prove to people that the new technology really is better. This is a test that we did uh, back when we were starting to promote Class D amplifiers. And what we did is we had, it was so old, I think it was actually a CD player here. So we had a CD player, and we had that CD player driving two of our EVMs. And again, it was so long ago that we were using nickel metal hydride batteries. But we had a stack of, of three of those for about 3.6 volts, and we basically charged those two battery stacks up. And then we used, we used LabVIEW to, to constantly measure the voltage on the battery stack as a function of time. So that's kind of the setup that we had going on in the lab, and then this was the outcome of that. What we found is the Class AB amplifier, it ran for about 47 and a half hours until one of the batteries in the stack collapsed. But the Class D amplifier, you can see it ran all the way out to almost 111 hours, so it was about 2.3 times longer. In a real system, you wouldn't, ex you wouldn't get that big of an advantage because you'd have other things like the RF amplifier and other things drawing, uh, consuming power. But just as a head-to-head -head comparison, this was something that we used to use to show customers how much more efficient the Class D is than the Class AB. Is... So basically the way that we achieve this efficiency is in the output, output stage here. So in a class AB or a class A or a class B amplifier, you, have, you, still have a, you still have a half bridge like this, but the biasing allows, uh, both transistors are biased right on the edge of, of saturation, so there's some quiescent current that's flowing through the output stage at all times. And then as you modulate the signal, the voltage transistors either grows or reduces in order to get the appropriate voltage delivered to the load. The problem that you have in a class AB amplifier is you have a transistor with a large voltage drop across it and a large current at the same time. So when you do the, the VI product of that, you end up with a large power dissipation. Class AB amplifier, if you guys are familiar with LDOs, uh, low dropout regulators, it's a very similar concept to where you just have a transistor that drops some voltage, the current's going through, so the current times the voltage is is the power dissipation, so there's a lot of power dissipation. If you compare that to like a buck regulator, which is a switch mode power supply, that one runs at very high efficiency for the same reason that our Class D runs at high efficiency. The technology between the two is very similar. If you understand one, you can understand the other very easily. So what we do here is we have a half, half bridge of MOSFET transistors, and those are driven by a gate drive, and what we do is we replicate the audio signal with a PWM waveform. Instead of doing the voltage, in, uh, voltage drop across the, the, uh, the load, what we do is we reproduce the audio signal in the PWM of the output signal. This is the audio input waveform that we're playing here. So this is some, uh, in this case, it would have to be like a high frequency close to 20 kilohertz audio signal. And what we do is we compare, we have a high-speed comparator inside of our devices, which is kind of the heart of the Class D amplifier. And on one side of the audio of the, of the comparator, we apply the audio input signal. And then on the other side, we apply a 250 kilohertz triangle wave, which is right here. And when those two waveforms essentially cross, the comparator changes state. And that drives the output either high or low on each half of the H bridge. So basically, if you look at this, if you, if you just focus on the non-inverting one here for a moment, you can see when the signal is high, the pulse width gets very wide. And then when the signal goes low, the pulse width gets very narrow. 
So what you do is you apply a low pass filter to this waveform and then you essentially get the audio waveform back. And the way that we can kind of do that is, is uh, we use sort of like a, sort of like the Nyquist rate, except we use a much higher version than the Nyquist rate because this is running at 250 kilohertz and we just need to reproduce 20 kilohertz for most audio unless you do high, uh, high definition audio. So that's kind of the heart of how the class D amplifier works. And since the output is either all the way on or all the way off, you never have a case where you have high current and high voltage at the same time. So the power dissipation is very low in the amplifiers. And that's what allows us to do like 350 watts with just this little heat sink. Your giant subwoofer, what are you guys driving that with? A two amp. <laughs> but if you think about like your home stereo or a PA speaker or a guitar amp or something like that, they usually have a pretty big heat sink because they need to dissipate all of that power is lost as heat. So has everybody got the concept of our class D amplifier? Yes, sir. Now, where is the triangle wave being produced from? So that's a very good question. So the triangle wave is actually, that's actually very tricky because if you think about it, if there's any distortion on this triangle wave, it's going to end up corrupting the audio. Yeah, it'll mess up the dude as you recycle. Exactly. So we spend a lot of time making circuits that can reproduce this triangle wave very accurately with very good linearity so that we don't have, so that we don't introduce a, uh, any distortion there. Oscillator for that is always inside of our chips. Would you go back to the last slide? The end of your graph, what does a negative audio input sound like? So audio is an AC signal. So it goes above and below ground. What, what that means is, if you want to think about this in real world terms, what that means is when the signal goes positive, maybe your speaker moves in the forward direction, and then when it goes negative, it moves in the negative direction, and it comes back to rest in the middle. So we always have to deal with uh, the, the DC offset of different style amplifiers and things, but you want, normally, the speaker wants to rest it it's in the middle, and then it moves back and forth according to that. So this is just another example of, of kind of what I just discussed. We put the audio input to the input of the amplifier. We have the triangle wave generator here, which is input to the comparator. The uh, audio input comes here. We compare the audio input to the comparator. And that causes the, uh, the outputs to change state. And we have an H bridge. And the reason that we use an H bridge is that allows us to drive the speaker in what we call bridge tied load configuration. So you're basically driving both ends of the speaker almost like 180 degrees out of phase. So you end up with twice as much voltage swing across, across the speaker. So you end up having four times more power delivered to the load. And that's really important for low power applications where you're running off of say a lithium ion battery like a cell phone because that four X increase in power is gonna help you a lot. What we have here is is we have the H bridge, so these are switching at 250 kilohertz. We have some duty cycle coming out. So that's at the output of the amplifier. So that's always my favorite when customers call us up and they say, oh my gosh, your amplifier's not working. It's oscillating at 250 kilohertz. And I'm like, that's good. No. So they're looking at it right here with the 250 kilohertz. When you put an LC low pass filter in there, so this has a cutoff of maybe say uh, about 40 kilohertz. Then when you look at the signal after that, you can see that it's actually, it looks a lot like an amplified version of our input signal. So these inductors, you know, they're big magnetic devices. A lot of customers don't like those. So what we realized is we can actually use the characteristics of the speaker to, to help replace the need for these inductors. So we can drive a lot of speakers without using the output filter, and it saves a lot of space. So like most of the cell phone customers, actually none of the cell phone customers use a magnetic inductor as a part of their low pass filter. How does that impact the sound though? The speaker itself actually, it, since it can't reproduce the high frequency stuff, it seems like it does a good job. But like our high power stuff, we do actually end up using filters. We found that the toroids are really good. And then sometimes we use ferrite beads here okay. just to kind of roll off the corner a little bit to help with EMC issues. And what we actually found there is 
the fairy deep can introduce a lot of THD to the city. We spend a lot of time um, trying to find the fairy D that, that has an optimal performance. So one of our customers, I think I heard their name mentioned earlier here, they actually found these really awesome ferry beads that have really low THD performance, so they don't contribute any more uh, any THD to the amplifier. So here's an example of what I was talking about, how we use the, the bridge time load configuration. You can see here, we have a positive output and a negative output. So when you use the uh, math function on the scope to get a differential measurement of that, so you do channel one minus channel two, you can see that you end up with this signal here, which effectively puts two times the voltage across the speaker as what you had single-ended. So now we get twice the voltage, so four times the power. And you can see here how when the signal goes negative, the output shifts towards the negative direction, and at the peak, the duty cycle's been maximized, and then opposite over here, you can see how the duty cycle represents the audio signal. The black diagram from the, the chip that we just released. So we have the, the uh, half H bridge here, and there's four half H bridges, so you can drive two BTL speakers, and uh, gate drive, timing control. So the uh, I guess this is the comparator back here. Has anybody worked with half H bridges in like power management or something like that? We used it for a fan and one of. 303 layout? Yeah. H bridge? Yeah. yeah. Half. So we like to use a half H of two NMOS transistors. So we stack two NMOS transistors. And the reason we do that is the it's easier if you use a PMOS on the top side. The problem is the PMOS is like the mobility is like three times slower than the NMOS, so the space has to be like three times larger to get the same performance. So in order to save money on the uh, die size, we use little NMOS. If you look at this H bridge here, the output's connected to the middle, and then we have to drive the two NMOS transistors. What do you guys know about driving NMOS transistors? How do you turn them on? Using the voltage. Okay, so the and the voltage is referenced to what node on the transistor? Uh, the, gate. the gate. Okay, so it's gate to something. Gate. Go gate to source. source. Okay, good. All right, so we're going gate to source. You have to put, say, five volts gate to source to turn this transistor on, and that allows it to conduct back to ground. Now, if we want to turn the, the high side on, does anybody see any potential problems here? Shoot through. Okay, so shoot through is a big problem. We spend a lot of time on that. Any other problems people see? Think about the gate to source voltage. When this source is connected to output, when you turn this transistor on, it basically shorts the output to the PVDD. What's going to happen to the source voltage when we do that? It'll drop. Is it going to drop? The output's going to be higher. So, so the source is going to be at VDD, right? So now, if the source is at VDD, what voltage do we need to put on the gate to turn it on? Okay. So, if it's, so if we say 5 volts, right, that means that you have to have PVDD plus 5 volts for the gate. In the systems that our parts usually go into, PVDD is the highest voltage available. So where are we going to get this extra 5 volts from? <laughs> Maybe you will <laughs> so we. You can use a, you, you definitely need some sort of step up converter or step up voltage source. So have you guys studied about charge pumps? Nick, you did one in 303 lab. It's a DC to DC converter. Okay. Oh, that's not like it's not a pump. So one way you can do it is you can make you can use a circuit block that's called the charge pump, which basically uses two capacitors and you transfer the charge from the flying cap to the storage cap, and then you basically reverse the polarity and you end up jacking up the voltage by 2x. Oh, yeah. voltage don't work. Okay, sure, there you go. So you can use that. That circuit is a little bit, uh, it requires a lot of components, so it's a little bit expensive for us to integrate. We actually use what's called a bootstrap diode here, and there is a capacitor that goes between the bootstrap diode node and the PVDD node, 
and that capacitor gets charged up. Actually, in this chip, I think it gets charged up to 15 volts. So that gets charged up to 15 volts. So when the high side turns on, the gate drive is actually powered by that capacitor that provides the, the charge to turn the MOSFET on. Drawback to the bootstrap technique is that capacitor will slowly leak charge out of it, and eventually the output will switch off. So the charge pump is nice because it will continuously refresh the charge and it, you can do DC with it. But since we're doing audio, we're doing AC, the nodes, the output's always switching, so we're not so worried about that. Is there a rough estimate of how long it would have to go, or how long it would be held before it would discharge? Or? It, it depends on what the leakage is in the system. So this, uh, this presentation, I'm going to go through a couple pages on this one. This is actually about the new device we have here. And this is a presentation that we gave to our field application engineers. So we had a couple of conference calls with people worldwide about, um, about this new amplifier to train them on it. The one thing that we did with this is you can see it's called HD audio. So we designed this specifically for 96K 24-bit and 192K 24-bit to get better audio performance with this amplifier. It's by far, it has the best output noise of the power range that we have the lowest THD, and the audio bandwidth is greater than 96 kilohertz. And the output MOSFETs that we use are quite large, so we get um, more than 90% efficiency at full power level. And you can see here we're talking also about the crest factor, about sine waves again. So these are some of the applications that, that uh, we envision these for, like sound bars. This is a, just like a super high-end creative technology amplifier for like computer speakers and stuff. And then maybe something like a Bose. Uh, I think that might be an way I uh, IODAC. The this creative, one? yeah, like not only output, but Oh, yes, yeah, so it's, yes, as well. Actually, so, like, the thing that's fully cool about this, so um, at CES two years ago, my colleague and I were walking around the floor, and we ran, we stopped by the, the um, creative booth to see if any of their engineering staff was there. We we're going to drag them back to our booth and show them the stuff, which we eventually did. But the neat thing was, we talked to the product manager for this, and he was showing this, and if you flip this thing over, it's got like these two like battery doors in it. And I'm like, what's inside there? And if you open up the battery door, they actually have the op amps that do the signal conditioning are socketed. So if you don't like the op amps that Creative used in there, you can pull those out and you can put different ones in. It's quite... <laughs> so I was like, wow, this is crazy. This is kind of a, you know, it's sort of a high-end tinker kind of model thing. So, But it was like the first time I've ever seen anything like that. Because we, we actually see that a lot. You guys know you can get free samples from TI.com, right? If you make a MyTI.com account, register with us, you can order some amount of free samples every, every 180 days or something crazy like that. So if you guys need some parts for like senior design projects or just AEE projects, you can get them for free for, from us. But what we found is we have this one audio op-amp that's it's quite old. It's maybe 15 years old. And it's a former Burr Brown, which if you know like high-end audio, Burr Brown is like the best there is. The op amp is like $20 per op amp. And we, you could order like five samples at a time. So at one point, it was like the, by, by dollar value, it was the highest dollar value sample TI part. And one of our marketing guys was like, what's going on? And he started Googling around and stuff, and he found all these guys on DIY audio and all the other audio parts out there. If you go to TI.com, you can order these parts, and you can you know, replace them in your uh, AV receiver, and it'll work way better than the clay put in there. <laughs> Unfortunately, we took that off the free sample for you. Oh, you know, right? A couple things we did on this amplifier. So one thing that we wanted to do with it is we wanted to lower the noise floor so we can spec higher signal to noise ratios. It can be really irritating because you can hear kind of noise in your speaker. So some of the ways that we did that is we worked on the input resistor size. You guys know that resistors have thermal noise, right? 
so by trying to reduce the resistor value as low as possible, we tried to minimize the noise that way. The second thing we did then is we also made the closed loop gain as small as possible. We calculated how much gain you needed in order to get a 10% output level THD level. The problem I see a lot of our customers do is they always want to put the gain in the amplifier stage at the very end of the signal chain. So whatever accumulated noise sources you have up to that point, you then gain that up by you know, 20 dB, which is a factor of 10x. It's better if you can put the gain earlier in the system and run the power amp at a lower gain setting. Here we made the input resistance which is the thermal noise problem I discussed earlier. We tried to minimize that as much as possible, so it has a, about a 24K input resistance. And one of the things that helped us, or one of the things that we took into account to, to do that is, so everything is always a trade-off engineering, right? You've got this versus that. So the trade-off here that we were looking at is noise versus input blocking cap size. So we wanted to kind of keep it at a one microfarad cap, because that's available in a pretty small package, and our customers like that. The input is a series RC, so that makes what kind of filter? It's a high pass filter, right? So if we make the if we make the resistance lower and we want to have the same cutoff frequency, what do we have to do with the capacitance? We have to make that larger, right? So what we try to do here is optimize with the noise performance and still being able to use a one uh, microfarad cap, so that uh, drove us to a 24 kilo, kilo ohm input impedance. The next thing we tried to optimize on this was the THD performance. And some of the ways we did that is we increased the, the switching frequency to 600 kilohertz because we have a closed loop feedback. So the higher frequency helps with more correction there. We do a lot of work with a gate drive. Like you mentioned, the gate drive is really tricky when you're driving an H bridge because you want to make sure you never turn both the high side and low side cuts on at the same time because you could shoot through and either get a lot of power dissipation or worst case you can blow it up. Then we also optimize the loop filter to get better performance. So these are kind of the specs that we were shooting for with our simulations. So one watt, one kilohertz, we wanted to have less than 0.001% distortion. And then across at 5 kilohertz, less than 0.015. And then at full power in 5 kilohertz, we wanted it to be less than 0.05%. And we got pretty good correlation between what we measured and that as well. And then since we're trying to do HD audio to support the higher sample rates, we have good frequency response out to the more than 300 kilohertz. And another thing is, uh, I should mention this as well, so whenever you're dealing with any kind of, of switching magnetics, of course the higher the frequency you run it at, the smaller the magnetics can be. Changing from our previous device, which was 400 kilohertz to 600 kilohertz for this one, we can basically reduce the size of the core by 33%. So we can use a 33% smaller output filter for this device, which is our last one. Kind of some of the things that we, uh, that we look at when we're designing ICs is, how does it work like during startup and shutdown? So in audio, that's really important because people are very sensitive to pop. We spend a lot of time trying to figure out how we can optimize this. So we do like, we ramp the PWM signal, maybe a fast ramp in the beginning. And then once it gets closer to being at the final value, then we slow down the ramp of the PWM to get it close to the, close to the desired value. And that's controlled by an external capacitor on the IC. This is very interesting because pop is a very interesting thing if you're looking at that in your speakers. Is you can get a very small transient like this 10, uh, 10 millivolts, and that'll make a pop in your system. And over here we've got like a 70 millivolt. But pop is very difficult to deal with because you know this amplifier could do like 25 volts RMS output, and we're talking about a 10 millivolt transient in the response that we're trying to, to get rid of. Some other tricks that we do and I know a lot of other people do this as well, in different op-amps even, is we will have a special startup routine. So we have this signal inside the chip that's called int1 reset. And what that's used for is we have switches around some of the components inside the device. What we do is when it's getting powered up, like for example, one uh, place where you can generate pop is this capacitor has to get charged to about 8 volts has to be across it. 
And if you charge the one microfarad cap through the 24K resistor, the time constant is pretty long, and so it takes a long time to charge up. So what we do is we put a 2.4K resistor with the switch in series with it, and when we're powering it up, we short that, we close that switch, which allows us to charge that cap up 10 times faster. So it gives us a faster startup time. And likewise, around the integrator itself, we have a, a switch there that allows us to, to speed up the startup of that as well. We just had a conference in Dallas, an internal conference, and I noticed that our op-amp colleagues do a lot of these same tricks to optimize their startup as well. I guess in lieu of time, maybe this will be the last thing I talk about. So one problem <coughs> that we have with our Class D amplifiers is we have an integrator in the Class D amp, which is this part of the circuit here. And what happens is when you drive it into clipping, that integ integrator gets saturated. We're trying to reproduce a waveform that looks like this, but what ends up happening due to the clipping, that saturates the integrator, and it takes a while for it to recover to come out of saturation. So we get this really nasty looking transient right here, which gives the clipping a really high frequency like sound to it. We figured this out quite a few years ago, and what we do is we actually clamp the integrator that can't get it saturated. So after we apply that clamping technique, you can see that it's a much smoother waveform over here. So that's another uh, another feature that we've been putting in our chips for quite a few years now. And some one of our design engineers came up with that idea. We took all this stuff and we put it in the IC, and we just released it to the market. So we're starting to sell parts of it or sell it to customers. And we always make one of these evaluation modules for our parts when we release them. And it basically just makes it easy for customers to evaluate the part. So you can see here that we have audio inputs up here, and then we have the speaker connectors down here and the power supply here, and the, the chip sits right here. So we use this to, uh, we use this to generate the plots in the data sheet. We sell this on the web to customers, give it to bigger customers, and um, we also use it as kind of a reference design, so when customers are designing their systems, we, we suggest that they try to follow the guidelines that we use on our design, so it's kind of um, what these are. So if you guys want, uh, Alex, you mentioned you guys might be interested. So this, this runs at, uh, I think the maximum DVD is 36 volts. Okay. So if that's high enough for you guys, um, we don't have a power supply yet. I had a question or two on that one. Um, but uh, we could probably source some kind of power supply that could at least use that as a. We'll, we're, we'll make our own. Yes. We're going to use a transformer. Yeah. So, um, so that's our new device, the TPA3251. Uh, what questions do you guys have? Well, what kind of applications? I mean, specific. Uh, it's not going in a laptop, I'm assuming. No, no, no. So the. Um, like home theater, exactly. So the 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 um, so we we sell a lot of parts. I don't think this part market is very popular anymore. But a few years ago, it used to be the home theater in a box. We used to go to Walmart or something and get you know a DVD player and it had an amplifier built in. And it had five speakers and a subwoofer in it. So we these parts used to, we used to sell a lot of these into that. But they're kind of going more high end now. Like a lot of the stuff that I see are. Uh, you know, instead of a DVD, they just, they're called like network players. And you just connect them to your network connection and then you can stream stuff through them. So I see a lot of customers using this type of product for those because they want to have a relatively high power, uh, power rating. Um, maybe some high-end sound bars. It's probably a little bit too much power for a sound bar, but you could use it for that. Um, like I said, the network receivers, maybe some AV receivers. Um, we also you know we have a customer in the US that was kind of one of the driving forces behind this. But I actually don't know what they're planning on using it for. And then we're also looking, Natalie and I were talking about this earlier, we're also looking at converting this to a automotive grade part so that we can sell it to automotive customers for their use. So we have a lot of our parts we have qualified for automotive use, so we sell them to a lot of the people in 
Yes, sir. How does the price and sound quality vary from the Class D speaker or amplifiers to the Class A or AB? The sound quality is pretty similar. The Class AB stuff still beats us on just raw, you know, measurement data, and the Class AB stuff is is a very complicated discussion to figure out which is more expensive because it depends on how much of the system you look at. Uh, what we like to talk about, since it makes us look better, is like the entire system cost. So when you include the cost of like the heat sink, and then also maybe the cost of the power supply, because for the Class A B amplifier, you might need a more powerful power supply to help with all the losses. So we try to do a lot of calculations of where the trade-off point is at what power level. I think at one point we came like maybe around 50 watts. Below 50 watts class AB was cheaper, above 50 watts class D is cheaper. But what we generally see is, is the customers that buy our class D parts, they buy them because of the advantages they bring, they bring to their application. So like another large, another large application of our class D amplifiers is uh, LCD TVs. So you know they're trying to make those thinner and thinner and thinner so they don't have space for a heat sink in there. So they've been using our class D stuff for probably more than 10 years in LCD TVs. Um, and the other reason that they like them is the LCD screen is actually color sensitive. Uh, temp the color changes with temperature. So if you have like a really hot component behind the TV, it can make a weird like little outline that I see there. So they like the plastic for that reason as well. So it all comes down to heat in that case. Because it's plugged in the wall so you're not worried about power so much. So if you, you can use it in an LCD TV, is with the, I, I guess I'm questioning about the specifically that triangle wave that you then have, mm -hmm. does that still work at two, um, 250K? So this one, the triangle wave is actually 600K, but yeah, okay. so. Is there like a way that you like restructure it to work for like a TV which is like audio or visual? Uh, oh, sorry, the TV application is the audio part of the TV. So we're just driving the TV. I thought you were making colors or no, something. No, no, no. Like, that's, that's absurd. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's just the, uh, we, we're just driving the speakers. Um, for automotive, why would why would they be trying to go to Class C? I mean, battery, power, I mean. But yeah, so. so uh, is that like hybrid cars or battery powered so cars? In, in all seriousness, like. Yeah. The automotive, like, so the government has the CARB ratings, I think it's called, which is, is, is it CARB, which is the mileage? Cafe. Cafe, that's right. Cafe. Um, so they have, the government tells the automotive manufacturers, your entire fleet has to average a certain miles per gallon. So like the, the Ford F-150 that they just came out with in 2015 or whatever it is, you know, it's got like an aluminum hood, you know. The reason they used an aluminum hood is because they could save, you know, five or ten pounds of weight, and that helps with the fuel economy. So the same thing with Class D, you know, if they don't need a heat sink, they, they don't need as much power to drive it, so it's more efficient all around, so it helps save weight and power so they can get better gas mileage. So it all comes down to gas mileage. Because I think I was reading something in, I think 2025, the target is 50 miles per gallon. So like GM, the average of all of their cars and light trucks is going to have to be 50 miles per gallon. And I, mean, I don't think they're anywhere near that now. <laughs> <laughs> the only company that I can think of that's actually that close is Tesla because, well, it doesn't count, they run on coal. <laughs> <laughs> it's all dinosaurs. Got me yeah. there. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, well, I know you guys are all busy, so I'll let you go. Uh, there's more pizza up here if you want to get some more, and if you want to hang around and talk to us about uh, amplifiers, opportunities to TI, whatever you want to talk about, we're here. Thank you.